uh, a big welcome to all of you, uh, our very valued supporters. Because of you, new treatments and therapies being discovered at CIRA put hope in sight for the vision impaired. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start today's forum. Uh, before we begin, there are toilets that are located at the rear of the foyer on this floor, just at the back here, uh, and are fitted for uh, the use of wheelchairs as well. In the unlikely event that uh, we have an emergency, we ask you to follow the directions from fire wardens and calmly exit the building. Um, it's a great pleasure to see you all here today. I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to, to have a chat with you and meet with you in person after the forum, um, when we'll be having a light lunch. May is Macula Month at CIRA, and many of you may have already received uh, this year's uh, tax appeal, which comes out around this time, and is focused this year on age-related macular degeneration. Macular diseases are uh, becoming more common uh, for quite a simple reason. Fortunately, people today are much more likely than at any other point in history to reach their 60s and beyond. So whilst it's important uh, not only that we, we live a long life and we age well, um, but we, we also maintain our overall health and wellbeing at the same time. So today our speakers will share with you uh, much of their research experience and knowledge and provide you with some essential steps that you can take now into the future to ensure uh, your healthy ageing eyes. It's something that we're very passionate about at CIRA. Uh, sight is such a precious sense and through our research we're committed to developing new treatments which will help make life better for people with ageing eye disease and help to save and even to restore sight. So in a moment I will introduce our panellists for today but before I do I'd like to share with you a video which explains a little more about Sarah's work and research. Well we work in a fantastic field and, and we're at a really exciting time in eye research because building on some of the knowledge that we've gained about how the eye works over the years, we're now starting to turn that into treatments for conditions that were never previously treated. Technology is transforming eye research. We're seeing advances in imaging technologies which mean that we can see aspects of the eye that we've never been able to see before. My research involves using artificial intelligence to early detect the signs of a condition known as keratoconus. I hope that my research would be able to improve the quality of life of these patients. The research that I do is based around trying to predict who's at highest risk of progressing from the early stages of macular degeneration to the later stages which can have a real serious effect on someone's vision and ability to see. For dry macular degeneration where cells are dying, we currently have no treatment. And what we've been particularly interested in is trying to slow the progression from the earlier stages to late vision-threatening disease. And at the moment, we have no treatments. But I think we're on the cusp very much of having treatments. Finding new treatments is what we are here to do. And there have been real advances in developing new treatments for vision loss and blindness. But there are still patients that we can't treat. And that's the focus of our work. We want to slow down vision loss in those patients. And we want to restore the vision that they've lost to improve the quality of life. My research is in glaucoma and recently we've been investigating vitamin B3 to look at whether you can protect nerve cells and prevent their damage to prevent vision loss in glaucoma. Current treatments for glaucoma are all targeted at lowering eye pressure. However, we know that some people can still progress and lose vision despite treatment. So new therapies to help these people are always important. Clinical trials are important because they are the most scientific way of making sure that a treatment actually works and is safe. Well gene therapy can be used in a whole variety of different ways in the eye and in my work developing new treatments for glaucoma we use gene therapy to make the optic nerve more resistant to injury and ideally that will preserve vision of patients and hopefully also restore vision when patients have lost it. My research is trying to produce a tissue engineered cornea. We're going to use stem cells which are created from either skin or blood cells and use those to build corneal transplants in the laboratory. 
About 12 million people worldwide are waiting on a donor cornea and can't get one. My hope for the research is that we can provide corneal donation tissue, tissue engineered cornea to everyone in the world who needs it. We have kept our, our research going, our clinical research, our lab-based research, the whole way through the pandemic and now that we're coming out the other side of that, we're starting to expand and to grow. So we've got some pretty exciting opportunities to build on the success we have as the largest clinical trial centre for vision and eye research in Australia and, and make ourselves even more capable into the future so that we can help bring new therapies to, to patients. When you do research, you not only help every single person that you see in the room, you actually have the potential of improving the life or the vision of people around the world. That possibility of, of really making a difference to so many people is what I think drives most of us here at Sarah. So, so as you can see, uh, we've outlined in the video, the, the incredible groundbreaking uh, and world-leading research that we're committed to, um, to, we're committed to helping people through this research. And as part of, um, of that commitment uh, to the community, um, part of it involves sharing uh, this knowledge at community forums such as this. Um, today we will be hearing from uh, four of our researchers who will each be speaking for about 15 minutes uh, and then we'll have plenty of time afterwards for your, your questions. So now it's time to hear from the first of our presenters who some of you may have heard uh, on the ABC radio with David Astle um, or whose work you may have read about in our uh, visionary newsletter. So Dr. Flora Hui is an optometrist, clinician, scientist and research fellow at CIRA and at the University of Melbourne. She has a particular interest in new treatments and diagnostics for eye disease, including glaucoma. Flora completed a master's and PhD in lab-based research focusing on glaucoma and using eye imaging as a biomarker for brain health. Building on this, she was involved in a landmark clinical study investigating the use of hyperspectral imaging to accurately differentiate people who were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Flora conducted the world first clinical trial of nicotinamide, which is vitamin B3 in glaucoma, showing its potential to be protective in the course of the disease. She's now continuing this work to determine whether vitamin B3 can prevent vision loss and be incorporated into standard clinical cl care. Flora is a very passionate science communicator and was selected as one of 2022's ABC Top 5 uh, for Science and is one of the superstars of STEM for 2023 and 2024. So I'd ask you um, to extend a warm welcome to Dr Flora Hui. Thanks, Flora. Thank you, Ryan, and it's so lovely to be here today. Thank you for having me, and it's great to see everyone in person as well, especially because a lot of this I've previously done on Zoom in recent years. So it's very lovely to see all of you and happy to chat afterwards as well. So as Ryan mentioned, I'm Flora, and I'm one of the research fellows at CIRA, and today I'll be talking to you a bit about glaucoma. So we believe that over 300,000 Australians actually currently have glaucoma. And around the world, we think about 80 million people have the condition. And it's actually one of the leading causes of blindness around the world. However, we also think that about 50% of people don't actually know they have glaucoma. And that's because glaucoma is known as the silent thief of sight. A lot of the time, people don't actually know they have the condition because it doesn't come with a lot of symptoms. And glaucoma tends to affect our side vision first. And we don't really pay much attention to our side vision, meaning that a lot of the time, people don't actually find out that they have glaucoma until they go get their eyes tested with their optometrist or their ophthalmologist. So what actually is glaucoma? So here I've got a little schematic of the eye. Um, and as we can see with the orangey tissue at the back, that's called the retina. And if we zoom into the retina, if 
we zoom into the retina, we can, if we zoom into the retina, we can actually see that it's made up of all these different layers and types of cells at the back of the eye. And they all do different things, but all work together to help us process light so that we can see. And in glaucoma, these golden yellow cells, they're not this colour in reality, they are the ones that get affected in glaucoma. Now, these nerve cells are really important because they actually have the job of sending messages from our eye to our brain so that we can actually see. So in glaucoma, as we lose these cells, we can gradually lose vision. So that brings us to the question of how do we currently treat glaucoma? And that's by lowering eye pressure. Now, as many of you know, or may know that glaucoma has always used to be the thought of due to high eye pressure. And so then we thought the best way to treat it is to lower eye pressure. And currently, no matter which treatment that we give you, whether it's with eye drops, whether it's with laser, or whether with surgery, the main aim is to lower eye pressure in the eye. And we know that it can actually slow down the progression of the condition. However, we also know that roughly a third of patients actually can continue to progress and lose vision despite treatment and despite lowering eye pressure. So there must be something else that's going on. Now, the most well-studied risk factor for glaucoma is, of course, eye pressure. And we know that high eye pressure is not good for the nerve cells and the health of nerve cells in the eye. But there's actually a whole bunch of other risk factors as well. And these are just a few of them. But Biggest risk factor is ageing. Um, as we get older, um, we do have an increased risk of developing glaucoma. Um, but we also think that in some people that there might actually be poor blood flow to the eye as well. Now, of course, blood brings along nutrients and oxygen to the tissue that we need in order to function properly. So we do believe that potentially poor blood flow may be something that be contributing to glaucoma. Another thing is around energy demands. The tissue in the retina in the eye uses a lot of energy, and so we believe that um, potentially not being able to meet these energy demands actually means that this tissue can suffer and become injured over time. And last but not least is also genetics. We know that the, if you have a family history of glaucoma, then you are at increased risk of developing the condition. And for example, if you have a direct family member that has glaucoma, then your risk is about 10 times higher that you will develop glaucoma in your lifetime. But today I'm going to focus on energy demands and talk to you about the research that we've done around investigating this in glaucoma and how we can actually find new treatments based around this area. So as I mentioned, the retina uses a lot of energy in order to function properly. It has a huge job that's constant trying to help us process light and so that we can actually see. And the retina actually consumes just as much energy as the brain by weight. Now, the nerve cells in the eye that are affected by glaucoma, they have a huge energy consumption too because they're the ones sending the message from our eye to the brain. And we process vision at the back of the head, so it's got a really long way to travel in order to send messages to our brain so that we can see. And because of that, it uses a lot of energy to do so. And it gets its energy from mitochondria. So this little picture here is just a figure of what mitochondria kind of look like. But mitochondria basically act as batteries for our cells. It creates the energy that our nerve cells need in order to function properly. However, there's also research evidence now to show that mitochondria might actually be impaired early on in glaucoma. And this has been shown in preclinical studies and also in people who have glaucoma as well. So if the mitochondria aren't functioning properly, then perhaps when they're actually unable to meet the energy demands that the nerve cells need. And that means that when they're not getting enough energy, they can become injured and lost over time. Now, the good thing about mitochondria is that we have a pretty good idea as to how they actually create energy. Now, this is a very com confusing figure, but all you have to see is that the output in the green is energy. So, and this is just a snapshot of all the pathways that are involved in producing energy in mitochondria. 
But one of the key uh, molecules here is NAD in the blue, which is also known as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Now, NAD is a key factor for energy production, and it's actually a key building block for life on Earth. So we need NAD in order to survive as humans. But we also know that nicotinamide, which is a type of vitamin B3, is actually involved in the recycling of NAD in nerve cells. And that's in the dark green at the top. However, we also know that as we get older, NAD levels do drop in the eye. So they're reduced with age. And we know that in people who have primary open angle glaucoma, they have reduced levels of nicotinamide in their blood. And we also know now that the enzymes that are involved in that recycling pathway of NAD are actually essential for nerve cell health in the eye. So all of these signs have kind of pointed to the fact that this pathway actually may be really important in glaucoma. So we know that nicotinamide can help recycle NAD. So we all asked a very simple question. Can you actually boost NAD levels by providing nicotinamide? Now the great thing about nicotinamide is that it is actually available as a supplement. So this was first done in the lab, lab-based studies, to show does it even have an effect? And the answer is yes. So by providing supplements of nicotinamide, which is a type of vitamin B3, it could actually boost levels of NAD in the eye. It actually helped mitochondria become healthier, stay healthy, and allowed nerve cells to stay healthy too. So it was actually very protective in lab-based evidence. And so what we did here at CIRA is to ask the question, well, what about in people with glaucoma then? Nicotinamide is a supplement that's already available for purchase these days, and it's affordable. And because it's been around for over 70 years, we have a pretty good idea of what its safety profile is like. So here at CIRA, we did the first clinical trial of vitamin B3 in people with glaucoma and again asked a question of whether can we detect a change at all in people who have glaucoma. And so what we did was we asked, we recruited participants who had glaucoma and are currently treated for pressure lowering as well, and they took either nicotinamide or placebo mm -hmm. over a 12-week period. And we looked at how the nerve cells were working. And so on the left, we looked at how the nerve cells were working. And we also looked at visual fields. So many of you would have probably experienced visual field testing. And that's a, how, what we use to uh, measure our side vision to see if there are any losses there. And what we can see on the left here is that at 12 weeks, at 12 weeks time with vitamin B3, there was a boost in how nerve cells were working. And there was also a greater proportion of people who showed improvement in their visual field compared to those when they were on placebo. So this was very exciting, of course, but at the end of the day, it's only 12 weeks. And glaucoma is a chronic condition. It goes over years, and we tend to lose vision slowly over time. So that brings us to the vitamin B. So that, and sorry, before I go there, jumped ahead. And so we, this study was also supported by a, another study that came out of the US that looked at nicotinamide and pyruvate. And pyruvate is also involved in energy production. And they also showed um, positive results in the people with glaucoma there. So now we want to know what happens in the long term. And what about different populations as well? People from different backgrounds, as well as different types of glaucoma. Now it brings us to the vitamin B3 and glaucoma study. And this is what we're currently working on right now. So this is a two-year double mask study, meaning that neither I nor the participant know what we're taking, or what they're taking, sorry, I know what I'm taking. But it's a placebo-controlled trial as well, meaning that people are actually randomised to either receive vitamin B3 or receive placebo. And we're asking the question of whether nicotinamide can slow down vision loss over a two-year time period. 
This is actually a big international collaboration as well. So aside from us in Australia, um, we're also collaborating with people in Singapore, in Sweden and in the UK in order to look at whether we should be actually prescribing nicotinamide to people who have glaucoma. This means that having an international collaboration also means that we'll be able to answer the question of how it affects people who have different ethnicities, different backgrounds, and because we're coming from different countries and have so many people involved, we'll be able to look at different types of glaucoma as well. And so here at CIRA, we're currently uh, recruiting and testing patients for that. The QR code on the screen is if you would like any more information about the trial, it takes us to your, our website. And so when I get to the next slide, I'm going to go to some common questions that I asked, get asked of me in glaucoma. clicker does not seem to be working. But I do get the question most commonly is, should I be taking vitamin B3 right now? Because of course it is available as a supplement. And so first off, I want to say that not all vitamin B3 are the same. So when we think of vitamin B3, typically we're actually thinking of niacin, and that's what we find in Vegemite as well as other foods. And niacin actually is used throughout the human body um, for a whole host of functions. And it's actually, and because of that, it actually has a lot of side effects as well when you take it. But all the evidence that we have is around in glaucoma is around nicotinamide, um, whether it be lab based or when it comes to clinical trials. And we're currently studying the long-term benefits of nicotinamide in people who have glaucoma. Nicotinamide is available in the diet via a range of foods, including red meat and brown, nuts, uh, brown rice and nuts and seeds. However, it's only available in small doses. And in our studies, we're looking at a higher dose, which means that you can only get that via supplementation. And as always, um, if you are considering starting this, do remember to consult your doctor before starting any new medications. And so what I do, would like you to come, back, come away with though is how should I look after my eyes? And I think the biggest thing is to remember to get your eyes tested regularly, even if you feel like your vision is fine. A lot of the time, glaucoma is quite sneaky and you don't even know that you have it. So getting your eyes tested regularly is really the only way that you can get diagnosed and treated. And in glaucoma, early assessment is really key in order to avoid uh, for early treatment and in order to avoid vision loss. It's also really important to let people know if you have glaucoma, so let your family members know because there is that genetic risk. Um, so do let them know and also find out if there are any family members that actually have glaucoma as well. So this missed out on my thank you slide, but this work was actually, of course, an acute. Uh, a whole t involved a whole team of people across CIRA as well as internationally, and so it couldn't be done without them. And also with, ah, there they are, a non-exhaustive list of everybody who was involved, but also the crucial funding support that we received throughout the first trial, as well as moving forward in this next one. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flora. That was a wonderful presentation and, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you during our Q&A. Uh, a favourite of many of you at our community forums uh, and a familiar face also to many, um, I'd like to welcome Professor Robin Geimer AM. Robin is a Deputy Director uh, and Head of Macular Research at CIRA, Professor of Ophthalmology at Melbourne University and she's also a Senior Retinal Specialist at the Victorian, Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. Robin has been recognised for her significant service to uh, medicine in the ophthalmology field and in particular uh, as an age-related macular degeneration clinician, academic and researcher by being named a member in the General Division in the 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours List uh, and also, uh, more recently, being recognised in the 2021 Victorian Women's Honour Roll. 
Robin's current work revolves around investigating new strategies for treating early stages of AMD and identifying ways to improve the feasibility um, of conducting early intervention trials. So I'll now hand over to Professor Geimer, who will speak today about progress in treatments for dry relate, uh, age-related macular degeneration. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Thanks very much for the warm welcome. And like Flora, it's very lovely to see everyone again in person. Um, today, rather than just go through AMD again, because if you're a frequent flyer and attend this event, you will have heard that in several other years' presentations. So today, I was asked really to talk about the progression of dry macular degeneration, which is one of the forms of vision-threatening late AMD. So perhaps if we just refresh our memory on AMD. So I also recognise that some people in the audience potentially can't see the slides particularly well, and so hopefully I will describe what I'm talking about uh, as we go through. So just so we're all on the same page in terms of age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, we start off with some early changes, which are these de deposits in the retina that if you can see on the left, I'm not sure if we can turn some lights off, it might be easier to see. Um, and one in seven people over 50, so dare I say many of us in the room, uh, have a risk of having these early changes. And they usually do not come with vision, threat, vision changes, but what happens with progression is you get either the progression to either what's called dry or wet AMD. Depicted on the bottom is wet AMD, basically when there's bleeding in your eye. And we've had tremendous treatments for that for the past 15 or so years. Unfortunately, they involved frequent injections in the eye, but really have revolutionised the severe outcome. The one we're going to concentrate on the day, today is the one on the top, which is dry macular degeneration, and basically that's death of cells. So one by one, the cells in the retina just die away. And at the moment, we have no treatment uh, that we know that uh, saves those cells, although vitamin B3 sounded pretty good to me, or Vegemite. Without the change, uh, without any treatment, this is what happens. So there's this uh, area in the middle of the, the macula. So unlike glaucoma, which affects the periphery, macular generation uh, affects the, the middle. And so that's reading, driving, recognising faces are the main common um, symptoms. And so without treatment, you end up with a, a blob in your vision, either quickly with wet AMD or more slowly with dry AMD, as depicted here. And in general, the outcome for wet AMD without treatment is more significant than the final outcome in dry, that it's a denser, darker, bigger area in the middle that you don't see. So let us start with uh, people, one in seven over 50, that have these ageing deposits in the back of their eye. And if we can play the video, if I push, if you have a look now on the, the right, what you can see is as the drusen, which these deposits disappear, hopefully you can appreciate that there are layers of the retina that are just also disappearing, they collapse. We call this subsidence of the, the retina. So that as the cells die, they stop making the deposit and thus it, it ends up being this hole. And this is what you can see on a scan that often you would get when you go get your glasses checked at the optometrist. So that's the very beginning of dry macular degeneration. So how, what do we know about stopping it? So we do know that um, age and your genetics give you the greatest risk. And unfortunately, at the moment, we can't really fix either of those two things, although there's a lot of work being done on gene therapies to try and alter your genes. But at the moment, you, you have two parents that have given you your lot in life uh, and also your age, and they are the two biggest risk factors, so we can't really impact on those. We do know in terms of modifiable risk factors, smoking, and more and more now we're getting evidence that diet, exercise, health, keeping a healthy weight are important for all sorts of things. Alzheimer's is general healthy ageing and more and more even with age-related macular degeneration. So this is just showing that the, the treatment currently for wet AMD are these frequent injections. We now have four different choices. So a new drug came this year to try and help us get even better outcomes for wet macular degeneration, which is that bleeding. But unfortunately require these frequent injections, which sound unpleasant, but actually when you recognise that it's saving your vision, most people cope quite well. 
So let's turn our mind then to dry macular degeneration. And even those with uh, good experience at looking at the retina actually find it difficult to, to actually see if this has begun. It's quite a subtle change when you look in or on a coloured photo. But hopefully those that can see the black and white photo, it's much easier. This is the same patient. You can much easier to make out the bits that are missing, which are the black bits, as opposed to the more grey bits, which are normal. And so very useful to use this sort of imaging uh, to describe to patients and their families uh, what's actually going on. And I call these moth-eaten holes in the vision, which I think is a, a useful way to think about it. And when we study this disease, what we've been trying to do is slow down the growth of those moth-eaten holes. And you can see here a patient year one, year two, year three, and hopefully you can appreciate that the black holes are getting bigger. Interestingly, their visual acuity on the chart remains the same because those of you who have done your retinal training can appreciate that the middle actually is staying pretty good. It's the holes just, are just slightly around the middle. Eventually, the middle gets affected and then the vision starts to go down. But it would be really good if we could slow this process. Once we know it started, can we stop it progressing? And so also just going back to those scans that now regularly optometrists have, you start to see big holes. So hopefully you can also see that light going straight through the middle. So the light goes through because there's no cells stopping the light. And so when you look at those scans, you get the idea that there are cells missing. So embarrassingly, given that I've been doing this for 25 years or more, we still don't know the cause of age-related macular degeneration. There are many different pathways that have been implicated and so uh, for those that can appreciate the slide, it's very busy and very complicated, but really just to show you that that's the point. It's a very complicated uh, part of the, the retina. Many things are impacting, just like in glaucoma. Many different things could be uh, resulting in, in it. We're a bit better than not knowing anything. We can actually put them into bundles of different um, pathways that it, implicate different different areas of what, what the retina is needing. So, for example, exactly like glaucoma, energy, or is it something toxic uh, to the retina? So we've, we've made some progress in at least identifying the pathways that are involved. And recently this year I was uh, a part of a group uh, in America trying to put all those pathways together. It's called systems biology. Can you, can you sit in a room with everyone that knows all those systems and try together to try and put them in some sort of order and use, in fact, mathematical models, which is where I got lost in the process, but use models to try and uh, predict uh, how this disease is actually occurring. We didn't actually get very far and there'll be a meeting next year, but at least the, the concept was to actually get into the one room people that knew about these different pathways. So when people start to think about it, well, how would you intervene in dry AMD? People would, there is a, a process of trying to reduce toxic, so for some reason this is just keeping going, sorry. Um, toxic damage from perhaps light, because uh, we know the retina receives a lot of light. Uh, is that the problem? Sorry, it just seems to be on uh, automatic. Can we stop accumulation of debris in the back of the eye? Can we stop the eye from actually working as fast as it does, slow it down so that the accumulation of this debris is less? Can we actually replace cells that are missing by putting in stem cells? Can we try and stop inflammation that happens around those deposits? Or can we improve the blood flow, again like in glaucoma? So this slide shows that the main, the main, um, Whilst there is a lot of activities, if I could go back to that slide somehow, um, there's a lot of activity going on, but I wanted to show you that most of it in this slide is related to inflammation because we know from our genetics that um, the biggest risk factor is in certain genes and the biggest gene is related to the inflammatory pathway. And so a lot of effort has gone into suppressing inflammation in the back of the eye based on years of work in trying to identify the genes involved in age-related macular degeneration. And this on purpose is 
to impress you with how busy uh, the area is in terms of the complicated uh, systems involved. But this is the complement pathway. And so everyone's sort of trying, each different company is picking off a different part of this process to say, well, what if I block that one? Maybe that's better than blocking something else in the pathway. So the one that's furthest down the track in terms of a, tri a treatment that may work is blocking this thing called complement C3, which seems to be sort of in the middle, the beginning of the middle of this process. And so if you can stop this molecule from working, can you settle down inflammation in the back of the eye if that is indeed the cause of macular degeneration? And so, this is a, a graph for those that can appreciate graphs and uh, is the first treatment that looks promising. So it's called pegcetacoplin. Um, and so the gray line is, if you don't do anything, this is the growth of those holes that I was showing. But if you have an injection in your eye every month or every other month, you can see a slight reduction in the growth, the slope of that graph, like, me, you're probably saying, yeah, it's not much, <laughs> but it's a little bit. Uh, and so this is after two years of having an injection in your eye, we can slow down the rate of growth of those holes. And the hope is, hope maybe you can see that the graph is sort of separating. So the longer you go, hopefully, the bigger the difference. But this is what uh, we're ha um, putting our hopes on for the first treatment uh, of this disease. And so people will still get worse, they just get worse more slowly. So it's not the end of the, um, the process of finding a treatment, but it's a first step. And so the next treatment that's coming very soon after this one potentially is blocking just the, the another molecules down in the pathway. So this is called C5. And if you look at this graph, you'll say well, that's very similar to the one I've just shown you. So it looks like blocking this inflammatory pathway is beneficial, it probably isn't the cause of the disease, but once it's there, it may slow it down. So whilst there will be a lot of interest and excitement about our first treatment, um, it is not as if it's a, 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 um, a spectacular success in the sense of stopping it or actually improving vision. And I said that these treatments at the moment are injections in the eye for forever. Uh, others are working on is there some other way you can deliver this, these uh, treatments? And so this one is just to show you they've picked off another, another part of this pathway, but this is given as an injection into your tummy like you would give insulin, yeah? And so that way you could potentially treat both eyes at the same time um, and you wouldn't have to come in for an injection. Potentially you could do it at home with a home nurse. The problem is that you then suspect, sus you give the whole body this uh, immune suppression and so that's not good in terms of getting COVID or pneumonia. Or, and so patients in this study have to be fully Im immunised to um, common uh, infections that elderly people get. So some risks, but also some benefits. Other people have sort of said, well, sure, could we just you know, bump up uh, the um, suppression of this inflammation by making some gene therapy? So rather than trying to block uh, a process, could we augment another part of that pathway that tries to block its activity? And so this is an active program of a, a gene therapy, and the benefit of gene therapy is one treatment uh, and done. So you would only need one. It would be a surgery at the moment, although people are working on just injections, and then you'd have one, and then you wouldn't need anything more. So that hopefully is where we're going to end up, but at the moment we're not quite there. And then just to finally finish off, maybe we can't save those cells, could we replace them? Could we put a layer of cells, some stem cells, make them from skin or hair and put them in as the layer to um, augment the stuff that's still there? And then finally, well, what if you can't do that? Are there cells in the retina that you could encourage to become light-sensing cells? So take another layer of cells do some smart genetics and then put in the ability to respond to light. So it's called opto optokinetics, genetics, sorry. And so then in summary then, we actually have that first treatment, that blocking C3 approved in America. It was approved a couple of months ago. It's not yet here, it's not yet approved. You can see the problem. It's a treatment that will be expensive, it will be ongoing, it will be forever, Yet it do and it doesn't save vision, it slows it down what will our government do, do for that? 
who knows, it was approved in America. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look forward to seeing it. Will, it'll take another year um, before we know whether or not it's approved and then whether or not it's uh, on the free PBS list. But it is the first um, uh, toe in the door to a treatment. And, and if those old enough to remember the new treatments for wet, the first one also wasn't that good. It was a small step forward that opened the door for many that were coming. And so you can see there's a lot of activity in the dry AMD space. We may have our first one in Australia soon, but the next one's coming shortly after, then all these others are likely to tumble uh, not too long after that. And so it is quite an exciting time in this space because at the moment we have no treatment and uh, potentially we'll have something in our hands. So thank you and I'll answer some questions afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I'm sure you'll all agree it's a very exciting time for AMD research at CIRA uh, with many promising new treatments on the horizon and, uh, and, and many, many different lines of inquiry um, uh, being undertaken by our researchers. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Mark Daniel, um, who's an ophthalmic surgeon and, and leads CIRA's corneal research. He's a medical director to the Lion's Eye Donation Service and is working to develop a tissue engineered cornea. Professor Mark Daniel is a senior consultant at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, serving as the head of corneal service since 2011 and overseeing a team of surgeons performing corneal transpla uh, transplantation for Victoria. He has a significant research interest in the development of a bioengineered cornea, uh, and this has culminated in the formation of the Bienco Project, which is a national consortium aimed at accelerating access to corneal tissue for transplantation uh, for millions around the world awaiting access. Mark is an honorary professor at Harbin University in China and visits LV Prasad in Hyderabad. He is also the founder of the Keratoconus International Consortium and has achieved over $6 million in competitive grant funding. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Daniel. Thanks, Mark. Good. Thanks, Ryan. So um, I thought we'd have a bit of a change of pace now. Rather than talking about cells and drugs in the back of the eye, <coughs> we're going to talk about surgery and, and engineering solutions um, to help with surgery. And we're going to be talking about the cornea. So the cornea is the clear window on the front of the eye that um, keeps the dust out of the eye, keeps the fluid in the eye, but also um, allows for light to clearly pass into the, uh, through the lens into the retina. And corneal disease is a common cause of blindness. There are maybe nearly 13 million people waiting for a corneal transplant in the world. Um, and this number, the number of people requiring corneal transplant increases as patient's age. Now, when you're looking through a normal cornea, obviously everything is, is crystal clear, like the picture up the top. But when the cornea becomes cloudy, um, like when the, um, the inner layer of that cornea becomes damaged, it's like looking through frosted glass. And um, the retina and the optic nerve are, are no longer relevant if you can't uh, focus the light through onto them. Now, the way we fix that at the moment is just replacing the um, endothelial cells, so we do what we call an endothelial keratoplasty. But that's quite a tricky surgery to do, and I'll go into that in, in, a, in a little while. So, in Australia, we're lucky. We've got um, eye banks that are well organised that can provide safe uh, donor tissue to all the patients that we need. But many other places in the world um, don't have access to donor tissue. In particular, places in Southeast Asia, um, in the Middle East, Africa, and so on. And so. Um, Without access to a reliable eye bank, the people who have corneal blindness stay blind. We've come up with a, a two-stage solution. The first stage is to help um, our current patients in the developed world, and it's to make um, the corneal surgery more easy. So at the moment, um, we use um, a, a, corneal, a strip of corneal endothelial tissue, and that's difficult to insert. I'll go through that in a minute. And we're using a um, hydrogel device to um, to make that surgery easier. But our final goal really is to, is to engineer um, this endothelial transplant in the lab and then use that in patients. So current operation, what we do is we, um, we strip off the, um, the diseased cells from the inside of the cornea and then we use uh, specially prepared uh, donor 
cornea tissue. We cut that into um, a tiny sliver and insert that into the eye um, and attach it onto the inside of the eye with, um, with an air bubble. And you can see the, um, the picture down below is of um, a scan showing that corneal tissue attached onto the, um, onto the back of the cornea. What, we, what we're currently doing is actually just stripping off the layer of cells um, with their um, underlying um, supporting membrane and trying to transplant those. And you can see how, how delicate it is. It's probably not even possible to see. Just that very faint blue tissue in that top corner there um, is just that layer of cells being peeled off. And then it's cut to size and inserted. And you can see the, um, the little scrolled up blue um, scroll there. That's the layer of, um, of cells which scrolls up naturally by itself. And we pop that into the eye. And then the trick is to unfold that without touching it. And you have to unfold it upside down. So just by tapping on the cornea and using air bubbles and, um, and little jets of fluid, you orientate that, um, that tissue, get it into the right position, and then put an air bubble underneath on the bottom corner there, and that holds it all in position. Now, as you can imagine, that's uh, quite a tricky surgery. It can, you know, doing it all without touching it, or doing it with touching it is hard enough, but doing it without touching it inside an eye with... Every, every time that you bump it, you're losing, uh, damaging the tissue, <coughs> makes it very difficult indeed. So we've come up with a, um, um, a, a potential solution that, um, so here we go, this, this goes through it again. The insertion where it's all scrolled up, unscrolling it with the air bubble and the tapping, and then when it's finally in position, we hold it in position with an air bubble. And that can take, you know, anything from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours. So the solution we came up with was to use a, um, a hydrogel scaffold that we've been developing for many years and then attach that to the tissue with an uh, invented bioglue. Then that would, um, what happens when we put that inside the eyes, it pops open. We don't have to worry about that unscrolling issue. It's all perfectly in position. All we need to do is put the air bubble in and, um, and the operation is finished. The hydrogel film that, we've, uh, that the uh, collaborators at the University have invented is made up of a material called PEG, which is the same material that you have around capsules, um, you know, you take as tablets. Um, it's safe, it dissolves to nothing in the, in, the, um, in the body, it's already been used in many applications. But they've modified it to make it not only um, transparent, but robust enough to withstand surgery, um, incredibly thin and also compatible with cells and, um, and, and with the eye. And then the image on the right-hand side, um, we folded two layers of the hydrogel in the top half of that, um, of that circle, and there's none in the bottom half. And I think you'll agree they're almost exactly the same as far as the transparency goes. So um, this technology, we've been doing a lot of work on it to, to get it to the right uh, stiffness and also to make sure that, uh, that we can grow cells on it. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the bioglue, making sure that's safe and also effective enough to hold the two, two layers together. Um, and have now starting to do the, uh, the in vivo tests, the tests um, on our models to make sure that it's um, safe and effective and, and are planning to do human trials um, in the near future. So the um, phase two of this really, if you think about it, rather than using a whole donor on one piece of uh, the scaffold, why don't we just get the cells and grow them up onto the scaffold and then we could have you know, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of donors or hundreds of corneal transplants for, um, for each donor. And so the idea would be you'd use that hydrogel film, you'd grow the endothelial cells in culture, amplify them in the lab and then attach them onto your disc and that could be distributed around the world. Sounds pretty easy. Only problem, uh, these endothelial cells don't actually um, grow in the body. Once you've got a, a complement of them, that's it. If you damage the eye, they don't replace themselves. So we've done a lot of work to actually work out why that happens and then to um, work out how to get the cells to grow in the lab. And so these beautiful pictures here, with the, um, the, that's what the uh, endothelium looks like in our culture dishes, which looks almost indistinguishable from, from what it's like in life. So once we've got those cells to grow, um, we grow them on our film. Um, and then these are some comparisons of um, cells growing just on the 
normal tissue culture plastic compared to cells growing on the PHF. So they, it's, it's very biocompatible. The, um, the cells like growing on it and we get good numbers. So we can get the equivalent to uh, corneal transplants. And then we've done, done some uh, surgery doing this technique. So on this side, the, the um, animal has got no endothelial cells, a very cloudy cornea. We do the same surgery we do in humans and um, three weeks later, the cornea is crystal clear again. So, um, and we've done this on a number of times to show its efficacy. I'll move through these, but um, I think you've got it. Anyway, so what have we got, what, what are we up to so far? We've got this hygelix idea that's moved from um, an idea to um, a safety and efficacy study that's been funded by the Victorian government. And we're just finishing that now. <coughs> and we hope to go into manufacturing and do uh, human trials in the next year or two. In this more complicated bioengineered project, we've um, been doing the previous animal studies. We've got the cells growing. We've got the scaffolds growing. Um, and we've just applied for a, a very large grant to, to get that to work. Um, uh, over the next five years. And so the other part of the puzzle really then is actually making the middle layer of the cornea, the stroma, which is normally crystal clear and um, about half a millimetre thick. And so we're working with a group in uh, Wollongong who are developing ways of um, electro-compacting the collagen, making it more and more like uh, human, um, like it is in life from, uh, from manufactured products. And then we'll put all that together into a bioengineered cornea. Uh, this is a, they're one of their first prototypes. You can see um, him uh, poking on it. It looks like a normal cornea. It's sort of almost as strong as a normal cornea. And it's sort of uh, stiff enough that you could get in close to putting that into a, into a patient. So the team we've um, got uh, working on this are... Um, engineers from the university, we've got um, cell therapy and manufacturing people in ACERA, um, we've got cell biology people, surgeons, um, animal um, technologists and, and people who are good at commercialisation. And we're working with a group in, um, in the US as well that um, they run um, iBanks in the US and they've got all the supply chains set, set up to um, distribute um, the tissue and so on. So I'm happy to take any questions. That's a very brief overview of what we're doing. Um, but um, maybe now we, Ryan can take over and we can uh, have a Q&A &A session. Thanks, Mark. I'm sure there will be some questions when we um, progress to the Q&A &A after our next presentation from from Dr. Um, Heather Machen, who's a, an ophthalmic nurse and the, the senior project manager and Lions fellow to CIRA's Lions Eye Donation Service and Corneal Research Units. Uh, Heather uh, manages the CIRA Biobank and, and project leads on the Hygelix and Bienco projects that you've just heard about, as well as managing her own research across eye banking and nurse workforce development. She's worked in over 30 countries previously with Orbis International's Flying Eye Hospital and as a consultant to Fred Hollows Foundation New Zealand. Uh, Heather holds a PhD on corneal exportation and is passionate about improving eye tissue uh, donor awareness, the global ethic, uh, ethical and equitable access to tissues for transportation, training and research and the engagement and retention of nurses in the eye care workforce. So welcome Heather. Thank you so much, Ryan. So I'm not on your program today, so I'm a little bit of a ring in. And the reason why I'm here is because we, we wanted to do a special thank you and recognition to a very special group of donors who none of you are ever going to meet. And these are the donors who at the end of their life donate their eyes. And they donate them for transplantation, very much like Mark has just said, into corneal research. And they also donate their eyes into glaucoma for some of the glaucoma surgery that Flora's talked about today. These donors are incredible. They also provide tissue to us to train our surgeons. For example, many of the, the registrars that Mark is training are trained on how to do surgery and deal with the tissue because of these donors. And lastly, they donate 
for research. Many of the research projects you've heard about today, and including others into diabetes, into Alzheimer's, into, I'm just trying to think, uh, dry eye, which is something that I suffer, so I really hope they get that right. And so all of those different kinds of research, even understanding about the anatomy of the eye or the progression of disease, researchers are able to, to do that research because of end-of-life donors. And here in Victoria, since the eye bank at Sierra was established at 30 years ago, we've had over 15,000 end-of-life donors, and we cannot thank them enough, and we recognise them for their incredible contribution to the services towards everything that we enjoy here at CIRA and everything that we're doing towards the advancement of surgery. As Mark said, there's not enough donors, even for corneal transplantation, there are around 12 million people waiting for just a corneal transplantation, let alone glaucoma surgery all over the world. So I wanted to take this opportunity to sneak into your session today to do a special thank you. I know it's quite a morbid way to end the session, uh, but there is a beauty in this because this is giving, it's the very, very final last gift that these people give and they want to make sure it helps other people. So we, there is a beauty in that. So if you want to find out anything more about our services in terms of end of life donation of eyes, you can have a look at our website, which is attached to the CIRA website. You can find out about how we work in terms of our, our ethical conduct and, 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 and how we work with other hospitals to recover and work with um, loved ones at the end of your life. And you can also then go and have a look at the research at CIRA. Most importantly, if you personally ever wanted to become a donor, there's a couple of things that you can do. First of all, you can go onto the Donate Life Registry, which is on the right-hand side of the page there, and you can indicate your intent to become a donor. And that could be for other things like organs and bones and skin and all the other stuff below the neck that I don't work in. Um, you can also indicate there um, if you wanted to do one of those or none of those or all of them. So it's entirely up to you. While you, the register isn't a legally binding record, it provides an intent. So when you do die and you're in a hospital, the Donate Life coordinators in that hospital will contact our iBank and will ask your next of kin, did they want to become a donor? And what we'll do is we'll look on the registry to see if you actually intend, what your intentions were. So if your intentions were to become a donor and you indicated that, we'll talk to your loved ones and say, hey, look, they indicated that they wanted to become a donor. Can we fulfill their wishes for them? Now, obviously, if you're like me, you're very forgetful and you may not get around to ever filling in the register, and that's completely normal. There's a lot of us who never actually get around to it. And so one of the most important things you can do is actually have a conversation with your loved ones so that at the time of your passing, um, we'll ask them, even though they didn't fill out the register, do you know if they ever intended to become a donor? Uh, so please um, go home and have a conversation with your loved ones. My family know what my wishes are and I know what theirs are. So if uh, something was to happen to them today, I know exactly what they want. So thank you for um, allowing me to sneak into the session and uh, recognise our past donors and hopefully our future donors. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That's an, it is an extraordinary gift. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, my colleagues Callum and Matt, um, uh, as well as our presenters, if, if, if our presenters would like to join us on the stage, Callum and Matt will be roving about uh, with microphones so that you can ask any of today's speakers any questions you may have. Thank you to all of you, um, as always, a fabulous set of presentations. Uh, my question is really a quick one. Um, I've forgotten the last speaker's name, sorry. But uh, can, you, can you just, uh, would it be a good idea if people put in their advanced care directive as a specific um, statement? I mean, we are registered eye donors, um, registered donors, 
but um, our family's overseas. So when we pop off, um, that's the way it is. So if we had it in our advanced care directive, that because that's a legal document, then uh, anyone could get our eyes if they're any use. Yeah, there's a lot of legal and ethical elements to this, but the way that it's set up across Australia is the registry is the, is the only thing you can do in Australia at the moment. If you're in South Australia, you can put it on your um, driver's licence and that is going to come back in across Australia as well. But in terms of your advanced health directive, they, we would still go through the same process even if you've indicated it there. And also another point, some people also ask if they should put it in their will. Wills are read a long time after you die and we need to collect the corneas within 24 hours. So unfortunately the way um, national and state law is at the moment, the registry is the only one here in Victoria. Thank you. Or Heather. <laughs> uh, are you seeing any uh, COVID-related disease or, or related to the eye, um, eye health as, as COVID affects every cell in the body? So certainly you can get... Uh, we see every now and again in the clinic people that have had a, a retinal disease soon after COVID. It's always hard to prove that they were related, but... Certainly there's been what are called vein occlusions, so potentially people get dehydrated and thus they clot a little more and thus we see uh, what are called retinal vein occlusions associated with COVID. Um, but there are also, any virus can cause uh, inflammation in the retina if you're very unlucky and so it, some of them may be COVID related. Yes, yeah, certainly we haven't seen any affecting the cornea or the surface of the eye. Uh, apparently the um, virus can't attach itself to the eye directly, so it um, doesn't seem to have any effect. Maybe some of the um, autoimmune corneal graft rejection seems to be possibly related to COVID, but that's um, still um, uncertain at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. Those presentations were amazing. Um, I've recently come across the concept of genetic counselling. Um, can any of you talk to that, the process, what's involved, who can apply for it or go through the process? So there's a lot of activity now because there's um, what are called inherited retinal diseases. Uh, there's other inherited diseases, but let's talk about the retina. And so, in fact, uh, the government and the Royal Victorian Iron Age Hospital in Syria came together and made this sort of all-inclusive clinic. So, for example, if you have an inherited retinal disease, you can go to the clinic at the Iron Ear, be referred there, and as part of that team, there are genetic counsellors. Or, in the past, we've referred to, if they're kids, back to the children's, because there's a lot of interest in getting one's genes tested, but you really need someone to interpret that and, and what it means. So there are well-known inherited retinal diseases, and we're starting to chip away at replacing those genes one at the time. The first disease is retinitis pigmentosa and in Australia we've done the first few treatments where you can actually replace a very, very specific gene which changes that child from being blind to being sort of a normal seeing child dramatically if you get in early enough. So uh, gene counselling will make, a, make up a big part of that chat uh, as we start to get new genes um, to be able to change um, different diseases one at a time depending on the gene. So basically you would have to be referred to the clinic uh, to access that genetic counsellor. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, my question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Hui. Now, how often do we need to uh, check our eyesight? Because every year when my optometrist send me a letter asking me for an eye check, I suspect that they're after my money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so is it checking once a year is good enough, or do we have? Can I delay that checking? 
So typically over the age of 65 now, we do recommend a yearly checkup. And that's because a lot of eye conditions um, can occur slowly so that you don't actually notice that your vision is changing. And of course, a lot of other conditions kind of creep up um, as we get older, including cataracts, um, if you have diabetes, um, things like glaucoma, macular degeneration in its early stages may not necessarily how, uh, affect how you're seeing. So it is important to get your eyes tested, even if you feel like your vision is fine. Um, and of course, you don't have to buy anything if you don't want to, um, but it's good to know how your vision's actually doing and how the health of your eyes is actually tracking. Um, so doing, doing it annually is actually a pretty good idea. It's actually a very good point because now you can get glasses at the chemist, yeah, or you can order them online. And so people are actually missing that opportunity, that one opportunity a year to have their eyes checked. And so people are actually presenting later. Um, be, yeah. And so unfortunately, you can get, you can avoid having to go to get your glasses. A good idea. Again, again, thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, given that eye donations are, are needed, shall we say, I've never quite understood why, once you had cataract surgery, why your cornea is no longer considered useful. Um, is, if you do decide to donate eye tissue, can you make use of the rest, basically? So if, regardless of whether you've had cataract surgery, you can still become a, a donor. And we, we will have a look at your, your cornea, and if your cornea is intact and there's nothing wrong with it, you can still become a corneal donor. And of course, we could use other parts of the eye. Similarly, if you've had other conditions, uh, we, we can use your eye for donation. Yeah. yeah, I suppose the only thing to add is that the cataract surgery can, um, you lose some of those precious endothelial cells on the inside of the cornea. Um, and before we just assumed, I suppose, that there was a large loss, the sur previous surgery was a lot rougher on the eye. Whereas now we can actually measure how many cells are there and if there are sufficient cells, we can use the tissue. Thank you all for coming today and inviting me in. I feel kind of special, but I've had a lot of problems with both eyes. I've had detached retinas in left and right eye. I've had cataracts after that forming in both left and right eye. And uh, then I developed glaucoma, uh, which was uh, detected and operated by Professor Martin. And I just want, and that has been a resounding success where he apparently put a plastic disc into the glaucoma eye, the right eye. Uh, the experiment lasted just on or over 12 months where they did a lot of pressure eye testing and sight testing with the eye. Uh, I think the idea was, and I don't think there's too many people that have had that particular operation, and uh, the disc actually was a form of uh, administering the drops uh, over a period of up to 12 months, and now I'm back to using the drops. But I was just wondering if my eyes, with all the trauma that they've had over the uh, last 10 or 12 years, are worth donating. I don't know who could answer that. <laughs> uh, yes, because if they're not eligible for transplantation and you've consented for research, you, you're, you, you, someone like Professor Martin may like to look at how your eyes progressed over time. And so even if you do have an ocular condition or any condition, whether it's diabetes or Alzheimer's or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you still have the chance to, to become a donor at the end of your life because there's so much that we can learn from your experience. I see, yeah, because I'd be only willing to do that when yeah. that time comes. Yeah. Thank you. There, I, from what I read, there is a great increase in children's um, uh, reduction in eyesight around the world. I'm wondering if there are studies into exactly what is happening with children 
uh, what is the cause of this. So it's probably myopia, so short-sightedness. So there's an epidemic of short-sightedness in the world. Um, I guess people are thinking it's uh, due to in, you know, staying inside, not going outside. It was always thought to be perhaps due to reading too much, but it's possibly more likely to be due to not being outside. And so there's a lot of research in that because it's, it's very prevalent. Something like South Korea has like 90% of children are short-sighted. And whilst we think that you can correct them with a pair of glasses, and I like to tell people it's a sign of intelligence, because um, I wear them too, but um, actually if, if the eyeball grows too big, which is what happens in my opener, it, it, it has a lot of consequences, uh, particularly for your retina. Um, and so a little bit of myopia is not so bad. You can correct it with glasses, but too much myopia is, is quite a significant disease. It also happens to be Myopia Awareness Week, so it's a very good timing. But um, it is likely to be um, short-sightedness, as Robin mentioned. And there's actually a lot of work that's been done to looking at how to slow down progression of myopia in children. So a lot of the time now, there's actually ways that, um, whether through eye drops or different kinds of corrective glasses, and that we give to children who are showing obvious signs of progression of short-sightedness to try and slow that down. Because as Robin um, said, you know, a little bit of short-sightedness is okay. I'm one of those, um, but having too much of it can be detrimental to the health of the eye in the long run. So a lot of work is being done around how we can slow it down and what kind of other measures, including spending more time outside, getting enough sunlight, and that includes some of the research that's done here at Sierra as well, um, looking at ways that we can slow down uh, myopia in children. Thank you very much uh, for all of you for the uh, wonderful presentations. I really have learned a lot from you. My question is for Flora. Uh, you talked about NAD decreases along with age. And uh, I'm, my question is, uh, are there uh, like antioxidants or vitamins, for example, coenzyme Q10 also decrease with age? So should the glaucoma patients also take CoQ10 or other vitamins, minerals? Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. And you know, all these supplements, whether it's CoQ10 or acetylcholine or nicotinamide, vitamin B3, is all around the concept of neuroprotection, so protecting the nerve cells that we have, um, whether it's by um, increasing blood flow to the eye or supporting the energy demands of the nerve cells in order to help support them in glaucoma. So there has been some um, evidence around you know, taking these kind of antioxidants and supplements, um, but they've all been smaller clinical trials that have been done. And that's because doing these kind of clinical trials are actually quite hard to do. And so this clinical trial that we're doing now in vitamin B3 is, is going to be the biggest one by far, actually looking at a supplement that's going to help, um, whether it's going to help protect um, nerve tissue in glaucoma. So there are actually a lot of glaucoma patients who are on such supplements, like including things like ginkgo as well, um, and with the idea to potentially support the health of the nerve cells. Um, but we don't have a really strong um, research evidence base surrounding them yet. Yeah, thank you. And just remember that not necessarily, just because they're called supplements, they can have side effects as well. So it's not necessarily that you can take them and have no risk. So for example, in my area, if you take supplements for AMD that have a lot of zinc, zinc binds iron that stop, stops um, iron binding hemoglobin and so you become anemic and so patients then get investigated for anemia and they have the colonoscopy and the gastroscopy where they've forgotten to tell their GP that they're on a a zinc supplement, so if you are going to take something then you need to tell the GP. And also there are some that cause more bleeding at time of surgery. And also, just in the back of everyone's mind, remember that these, these cofactors that help energy also are helping cells that are neoplastic or cancer cells. So one of the risks uh, in one of the diseases I look at is we have a very good supplement that we could use, but the risk is of increasing cancer. And indeed, in the early trials for uh, AMD supplements, there was an increased risk of lung cancer. So, so you know, if the cell is lacking energy, also bad cells will be wanting uh, the same energy. So, 
not everything is with, without consequences. So just talk to the GP first would be my advice. Sorry about that. Just like to ask a second question. Uh, since uh, supplements had uh, a lot of side effects, I'm just wondering what's the uh, future for stem cell therapy? Because stem cells seems to be the way to go for a lot of uh, disease treatments. Yeah, no, um, look, I, I agree. Um, you know, theoretically, they're, they're a brilliant idea. You know, and we've got a, uh, one of our students in the lab who's. Um, converting skin cells into, into stem cells, and then from that he's converting those cells back into corneal cells, and then from that into these endothelial cells. The, you know, the, the, he's sort of um, managed to get a picture that looks really nice, but we've got to prove that it's exactly the same cell with no other problems associated with it. So there's no other cells that have snuck in that are gonna turn into a tumor, that the cells are gonna work exactly the same. We've got to find all the same markers. It's quite a bit of work, and then the, um, the regulations around that um, before we can actually get it rolled out as a treatment are, are complicated as well. So donor tissue is straightforward. We know that it's the cornea and it, we put another into another person and it'll work and there's a bit of rejection that we can monitor for and um, not, there's not enough supply and so on, but um, we sort of know those issues. When we grow these cells from from um, or convert them from nothing, I mean, the potential is unlimited. It's just every step of the way there's some, uh, some thought or some complication that we have to overcome and it's going to take a little bit of time. And in, in the retina, there's a lot of work in replacing a layer of cells called the retina, retinal pigment epithelium that's thought to be, um, um, so it's lost in AMD. The trouble is you will put it back into the environment which is not friendly, so the inflammation is still there, you're putting it on a membrane that is thick and full of stuff, and so whether or not they'll last is, is the problem. So you might be able to put them in, uh, you might be able to stop them rejecting, but um, it's just, you've put them into, if they're not the cause of the disease, then the disease is still there, and so they're just gonna go again. So um, it not, may not necessarily work so well. Um, if you could cause those cells to um, divide and in themselves, so that's uh, where we've done, and I've spoken before about our laser study, so rather than replace those cells from outside, what if you could cause the cells that are there to divide into more healthy cells? And that's the way we're, we're looking at our, our laser treatment, is to try and rejuvenate the cells that are there, and maybe you know, if Mark could cause those cells to divide rather than having to grow them in a dish, that might be another thought. Um, so, yeah, but in general, uh, if it did work, it would be a, a, a treatment that may last for a long time. Right, so it's, so it's the early stage yet, yeah. yeah. Although there are trials, so it's not so early. Mm, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Short-sightedness, does it continue for the rest of your life to get worse if you have it? No, it usually stops when you stop growing. So that's why, that's the myopia, um, another name for short-sightedness. So normally it's as your eyeball grows, as you're growing. So it usually stops in your mid-twenties, usually. Well, thank you to all of our presenters today. It's been a fantastic and very informative session. Um, so uh, if, if there's no more questions, um, you're free to leave the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you all. There I am. Um, so th thank you so much uh, for all coming today. Um, it's, it's, it's great to see you and so many of you here in person. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to talk to you about some of the ways that you can help support this incredible work that you've heard about today um, and, and be a light for people who are living with eye disease. Finding new treatments uh, to improve the lives of patients with eye diseases is at the heart um, of all that we do at CIRA. Uh, and it is your compassion and commitment uh, and the generous support that you give that makes this critical work possible. 
So by pledging um, to, to, to support CIRA, whether that be through a monthly donation, um, by donating to, to our appeal, and, and you'll see that it is our, uh, our appeal this year is focused on, on macular degeneration. Um, you can support our world-leading research and our clinical trials, and, and most importantly, you can make a, a real difference for those who are living with eye disease. We have a new uh, monthly giving program, which is called CIRA Luminaries, and this is a, a very easy um, way to support our sight-saving work uh, in an ongoing sense uh, and ensuring that your donations have a, have a great impact. Um, this sort of support means that our scientists and clinicians can continue to perform very ambitious and, and life-changing research um, and help us to plan for long-term inquiries into eye conditions as well as, as giving us to, uh, the confidence to, 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 to plan in that long-term way. Another way that you can support our work is to consider leaving a gift to CIRA in your will. So a gift to uh, CIRA in, in your will is a, is a fantastic gift of hope and, and uh, hope for future generations who are living with eye disease. We invest every gift very carefully into, into research projects that will have the greatest impact for many years to come. Uh, every trial, every set of results and every breakthrough uh, is bringing us closer to, to a new era, a very exciting new era of vision and a world uh, hopefully free from uh, vision loss and blindness. By leaving a gift uh, to CIRA in your will, you'd be enabling these exciting breakthroughs in eye health uh, that will transform the treatment and diagnosis of eye diseases long into the future and leave a legacy of sight for future generations. So if you are uh, considering at present uh, creating or updating your will, it's, a, it's very easy to include a gift in your will to CIRA. If you are interested in in doing so, or you'd like to learn more, please do make sure um, that you that you speak to to our staff. Um, with our gifts in, in in wills and donor relations lead, Bron is is at the back here, um, and uh, and she can tell you more about the ways that you can support this critical work. I'd I'd now like to share a, a quick video of one of our treasured supporters, Jenny Turnbull, who's generously uh, uh, decided to leave a legacy gift in her will to Sarah. I was born in East Malvern and grew up in Oakley. It was a happy childhood and we had many happy holidays, day trips, picnics and I'm very grateful for the life I've had. My mother was diagnosed with glaucoma. It was 1961. Didn't mean much to me at that stage but in 1994, I went to an optometrist in the city and soon after I was diagnosed with glaucoma. The glaucoma hasn't stopped me doing anything at this particular time. I enjoy theater, I love being down the beach and just being able to appreciate these things through sight. I began donating to the Center for Eye Research in 1994 because I felt that I had benefited from having a very good specialist and because it's hereditary, I thought family could well get it in the future and it would be one area that I could give something towards research. I share a home now with a friend and we've been together for 44 years. Janet and I both play tennis. We enjoy working together in the garden. I guess we live far busier lives because anything comes up, there's two of you to do it. We have updated our wills. If there's any money over when I die, that I would leave them a small request to the Centre for Eye Research. I think it's an excellent organisation. It is world renowned and they have some excellent researchers and they're doing some great work. Work will continue on and if I can make some small contribution, I'm helping future generations. <laughs>